All right, it's two o'clock, so that means that we are starting. Uh, we always start uh, sharp on time. So um, welcome everybody uh, to this fifth and final webinar that is part of a series um, surrounding the exhibition Indonesia and Amsterdam School uh, that is currently on display in Museum at Schip. Um, and in this webinar series, uh, Museum at Schip joins forces with Heritage Hands On Uitzeld Documentatie Architectuur and uh, with Yaya San Museum Architectuur to explore the interrelation between architecture, design, and um, architecture and design in Indonesia and the Netherlands by inviting heritage experts, historians, architects, curators, and artists. Uh, my name is Melle van Mane, and for Museum Met Schip, I created the exhibition Indonesian Amsterdam School and which is also the reason for organizing this webinar series. Today, uh, we are talking about public housing in the Netherlands and Indonesia. And I think this is actually a very suitable topic to end our series with, because the architecture of the Amsterdam School would not have been built if public housing had not been embraced in Dutch parliament in the 1900s. When public housing likewise Without public housing, uh, there would not have been a museum at Schip, and we will not have been here today together, uh, here online. So uh, let's end this series with a topic uh, from which the Amsterdam School took off. I am excited to hear more about what, uh, in what ways Dutch policy was transmitted to the setting of colonial Indonesia, and I would like to hear more about the developments in public housing after Indonesian independence. Um, and for this uh, webinar, we have invited three very interesting speakers to join us. Uh, and for the introduction, I would like to give the floor to Anita Lim Lim. Uh, she will be our moderator for today. And Anita is a designer and researcher uh, who gained her architectural degree at Turamangari University in Jakarta and after which she worked in, a sev in several architectural firms. Her involvement in the revitalization of Kota Tua and Jakarta uh, has led her also to pursue a master's in heritage studies at the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And she was uh, one of the researchers and curatorial team members of the exhibition Indonesia and Amsterdam School. So um, yeah, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Anita, uh, please, Anita, inform us about today's program and the speakers. Okay. Um, thank you, Melo, and welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us in the fifth session of our Indonesia and Amsterdam School webinar series. I'm Anita Halim, and I will be your moderator today. Today also marked the last one of our webinars, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I would like to give much appreciation to all of our previous and current speakers, commentators, and audiences for supporting us from the very beginning of this webinar series. We kick-started our first webinar in February this year as a part of the exhibition program, so our hope is for this webinar to become an extension of the museum to reach a greater audiences and to become a platform where different ideas and perspectives meet together and being discussed. Um, the exhibition itself, which will run until August this year in Museum Headscape Amsterdam, has taken an art and architecture historical point of view to see the connection between Indonesia and the Amsterdam School movement. Among other topics which discuss um, the influence of Indonesian art and culture, public housing emerges as a unique theme, as it has nothing to do with Indonesian influences or at least not in an artistic way. But what makes us think that this topic has to be included is the relevancy and the sense of urgency in regards to housing problems nowadays. Amsterdam School as a movement in the early 20th century are very interrelated to many societal issues at the time. Uh, there was an attempt to restructure society through art and to modernize the society with this movement. The success, successful stories about, um, about public housing of Amsterdam School has shown the strength of collaboration between architects, municipalities, housing corporations, and private sectors. 
So to keep up with the momentum of this exhibition, we would like to talk about the emergence and the present state of the public housing in the Netherlands and Indonesia. We would also like to investigate if there is any idea of colonial urban planning and public housing policy that still resonates today. And more importantly, what can we learn from them? To answer these questions, we have three speakers today, Pauline Kahn van Roosmalen, Abidin Kusno, and Elisa Suta Nujaya. We also have two commenta commentators, Rizky Kalebos and Tatia Sopandi, to give remarks and insight from the presentation. And of course, all the audiences here are very welcome to join the discussion, to give remarks or ask questions, which you may send in at any time during the presentation through our chat box. And we will collect these questions and address them during our uh, Q&A session. We would love to hear more voices, so it will be great to turn on your video and microphone when asking the questions. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the first speaker today. Welcome to the webinar, Pauline. Dr. Pauline K.M. van Roosmalen is a Dutch architectural historical historian specializing in Dutch colonial and post-colonial architecture and planning in Indonesia. She regularly lectures and publishes on a variety of topics related to Dutch colonial architecture and planning. Her PhD thesis analyzes town plans and the professionalization of planning in the Dutch East Indies between 1905 and 1957. In 2022 uh, until 2023, she initiated and developed a course about colonial and post-colonial architecture and planning in Indonesia at Hofo Freie Universita Amsterdam. Van Rosmalen is the owner and the director of PKMVR Heritage Research Consultancy. So Pauline, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um... Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I have a very long presentation. I'm probably going to run out of time, so I'm not going to waste too much time um, into adding to the introduction. The only thing I'd like to express is my appreciation to the curators of the exhibition because it's just almost it's a few blocks away from my house. Um, I visited the exhibition a few times and I think it's a really intriguing exhibition. So for anybody who's in the area, and has a possibility to visit, I would recommend you go and see the exhibition. Um, and potentially, I don't know, maybe it's going to be um, traveled to Indonesia at some point in time. That would be great. I'm going to try and share my screen. Is it shared now? Looks like it. Anita, is it shared? Yes. Okay, good. It's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's perfect. Yeah. Um, maybe as um, another um, thing I'd like to point out before I start, uh, my presentation really only deals with the colonial period. So I'm really dealing about public housing in the Netherlands and the Dutch East Indies around 1900. And I'm going to try and compare very briefly um, what the situation was in the Netherlands and, and compare that to what happened in the Dutch East Indies. Um, and I'm going to start off with the developments in the Netherlands. Um, an important um, moment in time, a turning point actually in the approach to public or social housing, that's always difficult to find the right term to translate Volkshuisvesting, the Dutch term, um, was the Housing Act. The Housing Act was initiated basically to deal with completely unhygienic, overpopulated situations in the major cities in, in, in the Netherlands. And I here show you two examples from the situation in Amsterdam around towards the end of the 19th century, where you can see on the left that the canals were actually more like open sewages and that houses were really, really cramped together. That situation um, basically was the reason why private people and from time to time administrators and increasingly so administrators under the pressure of private people, of inhabitants of these cities, not necessarily of these houses, but the more affluent people 
towards the end of the 19th century increasingly got involved in um, and concerned about the situation of the um, low, low income groups in the cities that actually fired off the or, or initiated um, attempts and an effort to regulate housing in throughout the Netherlands and particularly in major cities like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague, Utrecht, you name it. Um, what you can sort of still see today in the Netherlands, if you look really carefully, is that maybe on the outside, the cities looked fairly decent. These images um, range from the 1950s to the 1970s. But when you look close up, you can see that sometimes there are things going on behind the more public facades on the streets. The alleys between houses, and sometimes they were very, very narrow, very often had um, led to housing facilities that actually weren't even worth being called housing. Um, people would, for example, if you look on the right, would live in basement apartments where there was no um, uh, flooring, no decent flooring, and where sometimes even the ceiling of the apartment, the house, was below street level. So in case of heavy rains or any kind of flooding, you would be flooded. But even if you live on the first floor, houses were very um, unhygienic. There wasn't enough light. There wasn't enough space for ventilation. Families were big, crammed together. And all of this was a result of the um, very rapid increase of people moving into cities from the countryside because as the Industrial Revolution started much earlier, but the after effects of that still rippled down into the 19th century, people kept flocking into the major cities and there wasn't simply wasn't enough houses housing provided for the newcomers in the city. So wherever they could find a place to live, they would live. Um, and it was this situation that, as I just mentioned, particularly the more affluent members of society, not all of them, but some affluent members of society started to be concerned and actually felt responsible, be that from a religious point of view or a more philosophical point of view, they felt the need to step in and try and help as much as they can, as they could. Uh, for example, uh, three major people in this effort um, in Amsterdam were Samuel Sarfati, who, um, who was very important in um, pointing out that not only houses were important, but that the town plan itself was important and that, for example, a town plan needed to contain green spaces for people if in their free time they wanted to get out of their houses or out of their office or out of their factory, that they would actually be able to spend some time in a more green environment. Piet van Ege was a very interesting person. Recently, somebody um, uh, did a PhD on Piet van Ege, who was very instrumental in, for example, the establishment of the first more or less decent hospital in Amsterdam, but was also responsible for the construction of the first public housing building block, which is actually also just around the corner from where I live here. And Floor Wiebout, slightly later on, became, it was a very socialist left-wing oriented um, politician who became a very prominent administrator in the city and campaigned for good social housing all his life. Um, and an important road in the Netherlands is named after Wieboud. Um, there's also a road called named after Van Eger, Van Egerstraat, and Safati has a park named after him. So these names still reverberate in the urban fabric of Amsterdam today. Um, and an example of what, for example, happened um, following initiatives like this was that um, not only the housing, housing conditions were addressed, but also the more general urban fabric condition was addressed. Amsterdam, for example, as was Utrecht and Rotterdam, um, 
was characterized by a lot of canals. Canals were not the clean canals you see today if you visit Amsterdam or Utrecht, a little bit less Rotterdam today. They were filthy. They were, as I mentioned earlier, open sewages where people would dump whatever they needed to dump. Um, and one example and a very nice example and a very famous example in Amsterdam is the street I show you here. What was formerly called the Goudsbloemgracht um, was completely transformed into a much more hygienic street. First of all, by closing the canal um, and secondly, by providing, by making sure the houses alongside the canal were addressed after the canal was um, closed off or, or um, sealed over. The Gaasbloemgracht then became known as the Willemstraat, named after the then reigning king. Um, this all happened around the middle of the 18th century, exactly at the time when Piet van Egen also started to get involved in housing projects. This is the housing project he initiated. For this housing project, he got some friends together, um, people with money and people with political influence. They set up an association and decided to build houses for the low income groups. Um, at the time, they were considered luxurious because they um, had um, they offered facilities that normally the houses, for example, in the alleys I showed you earlier, completely lacked. From today's point of view, they were quite um, 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 they were they were not very luxurious um, because they were small, and I'll show you how small they were. They are, they are, they're famous. They're, the name they're known under in the Netherlands is back-to-back -back apartments. Because as you can see, do you see my mouse now? So this is the front of the house on the street. And this is the back side of the house. And right through the middle of the building runs a line. And on one side of the line in the middle is one apartment. And then on the other side is another apartment. So this is the back-to-back -back situation. And as you can see, they're both, they're exactly mirrored on both sides of the road and very small. So what is called a living room is in fact also the kitchen because the kitchen is in the living room and there were only, there's only one bedroom. And then there is sort of like a bed in a cupboard situation. And it could easily be a house that was to accommodate a family with five, six, seven children. Um, at the time, people used to have families with lots of kids. So it wasn't a luxury, but it was much more of a luxury than having to live in a basement apartment or in a cramped, um, damp, dark house. At least here, you were provided with heating, you were provided with running water, not necessarily. Uh, there was even a loo here in the corner. Um, that was a luxury because otherwise you'd have to use a canal as your public loo, so to speak. So these were the developments uh, that people like Sarfati, Van Egen and uh, Wiebout initiated and campaigned for, which ultimately also panned out in uh, projects initiated in other cities by other um, citizens, sometimes affluent, sometimes not so affluent, they would get together and they would form housing corporations. And I here show you a few examples of some of these housing corporations. Very famous one is the one um, in Rotterdam. It's a garden city. The basic idea, the concept behind Tuindorp, Tuindorp as it's called in the Netherlands, Garden City, Vreewijk, is taken from Ebenezer Howard's publication, um, Ebenezer Howard was an Englishman who published a book about the garden city towards the end of the 19th century. And he argued that laborers needed to be provided with decent housing in a green environment. And he had a very schematic idea of what a garden city should look like, not only in terms of its urban layout, its urban fabric, but also the kinds of houses that were built in these garden cities, garden cities needed to be slightly removed from the nuclear city they belonged to. Um, 
it was very important that common green grounds were provided. It was also important that there was a communal house for communal um, 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 what's the word activities. Um, and that was all part of the gardens, uh, Garden City concept. That concept was taken over by quite a few of the initiative, initiators in the Netherlands who argued for decent housing. And Vreewijk, as well as Oostzaan in Amsterdam, are very nice and inspiring examples of these garden cities and of this garden city concept. They are still very vibrant areas today. On the outside, they have not really changed a lot. Very often they are now monuments, which means that you can't, for example, always put PV uh, panels on the roofs if you want, because that's better for to save energy and sustainability. But in terms of the way they look and function, they still keep have that vibe they had a hundred about 100 years ago when they were actually built. Um, I give you a few more examples to show you that not all these garden cities or, um, or similar quite, not necessarily separate, but as a neighborhood, they were very strong entities in existing, in existing urban fabrics. And I give you a few more examples to show you that architecturally, there wasn't one style that was applied to these housing initiatives. Um, I here show you two projects by Michel de, Michel de Clerc, um, who's also the architect of the building that accommodates Museum at Schip. Um, two examples that are famous are very Amsterdam school. Uh, I, I do not necessarily want to get, go into the, the characteristics of the Amsterdam School, but Amsterdam School was very much also in Amsterdam, a style applied to social housing projects like this. The Hembrugstraat you see on the left is the area around uh, het schip. The Harriette Ronnerplein in Amsterdam is part of Amsterdam South, which is um, the extension plan HP Berlage designed um, to accommodate much more housing in that part towards the south of Amsterdam when Amsterdam gradually expanded and um, actually its, its municipal borders actually were moved and beyond the previous existing borders. And um, I here show you another example a little bit further out both in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam of social housing projects and this is also to show you how different the architecture of the buildings could be. Um, and this is much more functionalist or modernist or whatever you want to call it. Jacobus Out is definitely a protagonist of uh, functionalism and het nieuwe bouwen, as we call it in Dutch. And Dick Geiner is very famous for his designs in Betondorp. Betondorp is named Betondorp, Beton Concrete Village, because a lot of the houses structurally are also concrete. So those are the varieties in public housing that were developed somewhere between, well, if you take it very early, starting with Piet van Ege, middle of the 19th century, taken all the way up to the 1920s and 30s in the Netherlands. Now, what happened in the Dutch East Indies? In the Dutch East Indies, the situation actually wasn't much better than it was in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, The Hague, you name it. Um, also in Batavia and Surabaya, Bandung, Samarang, all the major cities struggled with similar problems, that the existing urban fabric was very densely built up and situations were unhygienic. And also in Indonesia, water flows, kalis, rivers, canals were very often used as or functioned as open sewage. Um, I here show you some examples to show you. I Assume you're all aware of the fact that there are different cultures and ethnic groups living in the Dutch East Indies when the Dutch ruled Indonesia as a colony. I show you, I here show you two images of, of housing that, and this is a very, very generalized, um, oversimplified um, perspective on what actually happened. On the left, you see a kampong where predominantly Indonesians would live. 
And on the right, you see an example of a neighborhood that would be considered more European, i.e. that would Europeans would predominantly live in houses like this. Um, but the story about the poor housing conditions throughout the archipelago, throughout the colony, were similar. Um, and I show you two examples here to show you that it wasn't only on Java, it was also Sumatra, it was also Kalimantan, it was also Sulawesi, where people noticed that conditions were unhygienic. And this is a problem for public health. That was, as it was in the Netherlands, the main reason why people started to get worried and concerned about public housing. It had very much to do with public health. Cholera, pest, epidemics like that um, clearly were not what you wanted, but they were created by the unhygienic situations that were around in the Dutch East Indies. And it was a little bit worse in the Dutch East Indies because of the tropical climate. If it's 30 degrees all the time, you the risk of, you know, being confronted with epidemics was bigger than it was in the Netherlands. Um, and so taking its cue from the situation in the Netherlands, um, administrators predominantly in the Dutch East Indies at some point in time after 1900, 1905, 1910, um, started to contemplate, do we need a housing act similar like the one we have in the Netherlands? Um, and it's interesting to see that this concept of a housing act was discussed for about 10 years after um, the central government in Batavia decided to decentralize its administration. So after 1905, when a number of municipalities, local councils were established, these local councils decided we need to address housing from a local council point of view. Um, but we need more in terms of legal apparatus to support what we're doing. So they contemplated a housing act similar to the one in the Netherlands that had been established or enacted in 1901. Um, ultimately, in the Dutch East Indies, the central government decided that there was not going to be um, an Indies or a colonial housing act because they said the housing, the argument was the housing situation in the colony is so dire, it is better to have a bad house than no house at all. Because if we demolish all the houses based on a housing act that claims these houses are unfit to live in, we do not have the means financially, materially, um, human labor uh, uh, to uh, provide enough people with enough houses within a short period of time. So an Indonesian Housing Act under Dutch rule was never established, but it didn't stop people from getting involved in trying to improve the housing situation. And this was the housing situation, the image you see here. In many of the compounds, the people with absolutely no money would live in situations like that. And um, it were these two guys who around 1905, 1910 were very vocal in, in steering up and campaigning for decent housing from a public hygiene, public health point of view. They were both um, medical, tr medically trained. The Vogel was a GP, a general practitioner, a doctor. Tillema was a pharmacist. And through their profession, they, on a day-to-day -day basis, were confronted with the consequences of poor housing because it affected people's health. They were also both politicians. They were both on the board of the um, Samarang local council, the municipality. And in those capacities, they both of them together sometimes joined forces, sometimes individually, really campaigned for decent housing. The most vocal and the most visible, no doubt, was Tillema. Tillema was also an entrepreneur. He, um, he um, bottled mineral water uh, because that was much more hygienic than water from a, from, a, um, uh, from a tap, if there was a tap. Um, um, but he, and he invested a lot of his private money in non-commercial publications like these two, uh, both about 
housing in the colony in general. He traveled the colony to collect images for these publications and then handed these books out uh, free of charge to, uh, to politicians, both in the colony and in the Netherlands, in an attempt to make them aware that this was an important issue that needed to be addressed in the colony. This is what these oh, books look like on the inside, running out of time. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. How, how much more time do you give me? Um, two minutes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> these are some of the images that he, um, Tillema, um, to, to show you what the books look like. They're very well illustrated. Tillema wasn't only a critical about housing situations, he was critical about just about anything. This is an example. He criticized the advertisement on the left and he improved it on the right. So that's the level Tillema uh, uh, campaigned. Um, and what actually was the result of all of this is I can either go into this or let you just guess what happened. Uh, if I have two more minutes, then I can stop here and you don't know what happened. Up to you. Could you maybe um, very quickly just go through it? Yeah, I'll go through it. Yeah. I want to share, yes, I want to, I want to share three projects with you um, that deal with the improvement with, so how were then ultimately these compounds improved? And the first example of this, and it's not necessarily this one, the one in Batavia is not because Tillema was involved. It was an initiative by the Batavia local council. They decided to design and set up a model kampong. So a kampong that could then be rolled out throughout the archipelago because it was like, like a garden city model concept, it would work in the colony. Uh, it was very detailed. Uh, Tillema points out different plans in the different um, parts of this kampong. Um, there was also public loose shared um, communal baths, as you see on the right. Um, and it was actually built, this kampong, but it wasn't very successful because its designers missed quite a few cultural clues for example, how do Indonesians use their house? Where do you invite your guests? How do you use the bathroom? How do you use the kitchen? That was all completely missed by these designers. It was a very steep process. And I show you this map because here you can see it actually indicates that where Taman Sari was situated, but it also says Verlaten, which means abandoned. So after about four years, uh, after it was finished, constructed, because people didn't want to move in there, it basically was abandoned and ultimately the houses were destroyed. And another example, Thomas Carson, a famous uh, urban planner um, in Indonesia in the Dutch colonial time design. But part of his expansion plan wasn't only providing houses for the Europeans and the people with money, the middle or upper income groups. He very um, he was very keen on also providing, as part of this expansion plan, housing projects for the lower income groups. And Mlaten, of which you see um, a plan on the left, and it's indicated with a right dot um, where it's actually situated compared to the city of Saman, which is here, see is here. So everything in, in, in red lines is Carson's expansion plan. And one of the compound areas he provided in his plan is Malaten. This is an image of the way it looked, you see a slightly more detailed plan on the left. So very small houses, they very much tuned into what local people, what local Indonesians, much more than the Batavia plan supposedly were accustomed to and appreciated. And this is another um, kampung that was also part of Karsten's expansion plan, much more to the south in the hills that you can see here. So the Europeans and the more affluent people live here and the Indonesians would live down here in the valley. These kampongs, Mlaten, Lampongsari, and many of the 
kampongs, karsten designed for this expansion plan from 1916. Still today, if you walk the streets, you can use the old plan from 1916 and you will find your way. Last but not least, um, I want to share this project with you in Maidan, which um, a colleague um, in Cambridge once referred to as, oh, that's a co-op then. It's really a collaborative project where the Maidan local council decided we want to also um, provide low income groups with houses, but we really want to do this in collaboration with the future inhabitants. So rather than building it for the inhabitants, they actually offer them the opportunity to make a choice. Do you want us to build for you? Do you want to build it yourself? And if you want to build it yourself, what do you need? We can help you. We will subsidize the material you need. And as a pilot, they started off with this very tiny kampong here, Sikip. Um, and when that was successful, they decided to develop the other three areas. And again, these areas today um, still exist today. Again, the urban plan is still in place. The houses, if you look very carefully, you can still spot a few houses. A lot of them clearly have changed. They've been enlarged, they've been modernized. But the nucleus of these plans is still around. This all fired off ultimately a more or less organized um, period of Kampung improvements. Um, this is an image in Bandung. It ultimately boiled down basically to providing people with running water, uh, paving roads, and making sure there were decent gutters on both sides of the roads to, roads to deal with all the uh, superfluous water from time to time. Um, but basically that was what was done in terms of um, social housing. If you want to read more, a book from 1930, a PhD actually about how the Dutch East Indies took care of public housing, then maybe if you read Dutch, the one, the book on the right is interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, uh, for such a comprehensive overview of social housing uh, in both countries. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that has left most impression on me, perhaps, is the slide number two, with two pictures of housing condition in uh, the Netherlands and Dutch East Indies being shown side by side. I remember seeing the, the right picture, I think it was by uh, Tillemann. So just by itself so many times and thinking how this representation of Kampung has always been a double-edged sword in the advocacy for better housing because at the same time, the image has the possibility to cause stigmatization of Kampung as a slum and should not be become a part of the modernized society. But seeing the similar condition in the Netherlands visually, at the same time, I think it has given uh, much more nuance to both images uh, and showing the multiple layer of meanings and encourages people to find out more about the background story of how and why Kampong has shaped in the first place. So thanks again for the wonderful presentation. Um, and moving on next, we will continue the comparative theme as a tool to explore the ideas and practices of social housing in colonial context and also its impact on the post-colonial housing condition in Indonesia. I'm pleased to welcome our second speaker, Abidin Kusno. Welcome, Pa Abidin. Um, Abidin Kusno is a professor at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University, Toronto, and former director of the York Center for Asian Research. His recent publications include Jakarta, the City of a Thousand Dimensions. So um, please welcome Abidin Kusno. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anita, and also uh, Mele for including me uh, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I certainly really appreciate the spirit of this exhibition uh, and the conversation it tries to have. Um, so and I'm very appreciative to see Pauline, uh, you know, setting up uh, the basis for us to, to understand what we might call the housing uh, question, uh, both in the colonial uh, and also I think eventually we'll get to know a bit more on the post-colonial uh, condition. Uh, so let me just uh, start uh, by sharing with everyone uh, 
the slides that I have prepared. Um, so this is the title of my talk. Um, no Amsterdam school in Indonesia. This is basically trying to uh, give a sense of the difference between what I would call the metropole, which is the Netherlands uh, and the colony. Um, the connection between them, the difference between them, which is the topic of Pauline, and also later on the impact of colonial legacy on the post-colonial conditions. And I will talk a little bit about Amsterdam School since the exhibition is about uh, the Amsterdam School. Um, okay, so I have organized my talk around these five very interesting thought-provoking questions uh, provided by Anita and, and Malay. Um, and I will try to respond to this, each of these questions, maybe four minutes each, so that I wouldn't be going over uh, 20 minutes uh, slot. Uh, so the first one, which is, uh, what is the history uh, and current state of public housing in the Netherlands and Indonesia? Uh, I will save the current state of public housing uh, later on. Uh, and the, the, the Amsterdam part, I think Pauline has covered wonderfully, uh, though I will add later on a little bit on the Amsterdam school. Now, I would like to start with these quotations from our good friends, uh, Fred Colombins, who has done a lot of research on, on housing situations. Uh, in, in both Netherlands and, and Indonesia. Now, what is striking about these quotations is that basically uh, Fred indicates that public, public housing was to some extent, uh, sorry, it's an alien concept in colonial Indonesia. Yeah, so, you know, the condition is so different. Uh, and most constructions were undertaken by the private sector. And, and Pauline has in fact educated me just now that a lot of housing, in, even in Netherlands, were provided by private sectors as well, by private citizens, which is really quite interesting. Uh, but Frank is, is, I think, in some ways more conclusive, basically asking this very thought-provoking question. Why should the colonial government bother to provide public housing at all, right? So that, in fact, opened up a lot of questions uh, for us. So therefore, what I would like to emphasize here is that there's a big difference between uh, the metropole uh, and, and the colony. Yeah. Uh, these two places had never been equal. The social conditions were very different from each other. Uh, we, we don't have to compare the social groups, yeah. the Netherlands, they are largely populated by homogeneous group of citizens, at least you know up to World War II, whereas colonial Indonesia was inhabited by a very diverse, what we would call colonial subjects, right? And, and we know that there's a difference, there's a wonderful book by Mahmoud uh, Mamdani about uh, citizens and subjects. What what he was trying to indicate to us is that there's a big difference between being a citizen and being a being colonial subjects. So if you are living in under colonial conditions, the colonial state could just say something like, you know, we'll take care of our citizens, meaning say the European, but if not necessary, we don't need to intervene in the local affairs of the natives. Uh, you know, we can divide them into different ethnic categories as we see fit, and we can allocate space to each one of them to build their own dwellings, you know, such as kampong. And then each of these kampong would be then led by a reliable how a headsman, yeah, like kind of a capitan type. So therefore, in in the colonies, there were there were clusters of kampong, uh, which were formed without planning. Yeah, they were built individually and collectively in what is known as informal or traditional methods. Right? And, and they were social spaces, but they're all within the Kampung quarter. 
Uh, so you can imagine with a city divided by different quarters, there was hardly any coordination between one kampong with the other. So the colonial city was basically divided into different ethnic quarters and, and they were ruled indirectly. Yeah. So this kampong have some, some autonomy uh, in a sense. Um, and, and this is uh, quite important because without understanding colonial strategy of role, we won't be able to understand uh, these housing questions. Uh, so housing issues were organized around uh, this colonial mode of what we would call mode of governmentality, colonial duality. So you have an ind indirect uh, uh, role yeah, based on divide uh, and role strategy. There's a separation and, and also there's a coexistence between, on the one hand, the relatively planned sections of the city, yeah, organized by mostly uh, for the convenience of European, uh, and and the other on the other side is the kampong. Uh, so that is basically the kind of issues that that we have here. Yeah, the bit of the the history of uh, the history behind you know, the, the emergence of these questions of housing here. We have to understand the colonial mode of governing uh, society. Now, I want to quickly move on to the second questions here uh, with some emphasis on, on the Amsterdam School here. Now, what I find interesting, uh, which I've just recently learned uh, for these presentations here, uh, the Amsterdam School basically, yeah, uh, what, make it so important and, and famous is partly because of the support uh, from the local government. And of course, it has to do with the Housing Act of 1901, uh, which Pauline has already mentioned, you know, which is filled with socialist ideas. Um, and then especially since 1918, uh, with the winning of the Social Democrat Labour Party, you know, the, the city, the city government uh, almost gained absolute power, you know, to basically organize space uh, for its citizen. Uh, of course, it is easier to, to do this when, when you want to expand, say, Amsterdam, when you expand the city. Yeah, so certain part of, of uh, Amsterdam, I think is probably the northern part, were basically dedicated yeah, to help uh, to housing for the working class. Uh, and, and they will be governed by a board of aesthetic, which basically use uh, the architecture of um, Amsterdam as a guide. Yeah, so this is a, almost like, you know, an, uh, an utopian space for architects yeah, uh, to experiment with their idealisms, yeah, with the idea of registering uh, the working class consciousness. So there's a whole dedication uh, to use architecture uh, for class uh, consciousness. And so, you know, regardless of the cause, yeah, basically uh, the Housing Act to improve public health um, would in enforce all kind of a minimum standards uh, of sanitation and hygiene, regardless of the cause. And, and architects just have to design and bring all kind of, a, you know, ideas uh, to space, bring air and light into the interior yeah, by enlarging space, regardless of the cost as well. So there's this political will, which is extremely important, and financial support as well, uh, which allow Amsterdam School to become Amsterdam School as we know it, and how it is then associated uh, with uh, the, the socialist housing, yeah, the housing for the working class. So then it is important for us to ask the questions of how about the Dutch is in this? Now, the important thing is, of course, the metropole is different from the colony. That was the first question here. Right? The second question, which I think the really interesting one is, who were actually the working class in the context of colonial time? Yeah. So the working class in the metropole, you know, is different from what we call the working class in, in the colony. Who are the working class in the colony? This is the question that I think, you know, uh, a key key questions here, right? Are they civil servants? Are they formal workers? How about the kampung dwellers? Are they working class, right? So this is a, a lot of these categorical uh, issues here, and and we have always need to remember 
that colonial form of governance based on this duality here to allow kampong certain autonomy to self-manage themselves, right? Uh, allow the city government as, as well as the colonial state uh, to not taking full responsibility over the housing questions. Yeah, and we acknowledge and we also learn from Pauline that there are many initiatives from private individuals, reformers, you know, local politicians, uh, including architects to come up with ideal plan, you know, model of kampong and so on and so forth. But there's this important lack of political will yeah, from colonial government that somehow uh, that this allow this formations of of the housing act uh, in in the colony. Yeah. So as Pauline make a very good con conclusion, there's no Indonesian versions of housing act. Yeah. So so that is it. Yeah. Uh, and and so uh, there was pol uh, ethical policy. Yeah. And and it was supposed to pay attention to the living conditions of the colonized. And there was also at the same time. Uh, the same time when Amsterdam schools were, were experimenting with housing for the working class, uh, there was a group of architects who were experimenting uh, with Indonesian housing uh, culture. Yeah. The movement called the, the Indies Architecture. We know the name Henry Macklin Pond, Thomas Carlston, uh, and so on and, and so forth. But unlike the Amsterdam schools uh, architects, there was no public housing for them to design. Yeah. And, and of course, there was some, some interesting housing that Pauline has, has shown us. Yeah, but there were there were all these assumptions about, about the working class. Were they really intended for Kampung dwellers? Uh, that, that is also the real questions over here. So there was all these questions about who were the working class. Yeah. Kampung dwellers were the working class. You know, knowing the duality of colonial government, it is unlikely that kampong dwellers could be counted as the working class targeted uh, by, by, say, colonial government. And uh, there was one very important uh, Congress, the 1925 uh, Native Housing uh, Congress, which basically emphasized improvement of existing uh, kampong condition. And this, I, I think, in the end, um, produce what is called a Kampong Improvement uh, Project. Uh, but as Fred Columbins indicated, right, this Kampong Improvement Project was only supported by 1.25% of the city budget. Yeah. So again, this is a whole lack of uh, political will uh, that somehow uh, eliminate the whole idea of uh, public uh, housing uh, in, in the colony. So now I would like to move on to uh, question four, right? Do ideas from colonial urban planning and public housing still resonate today? Now, this is a profoundly interesting uh, research question here. Now, if we were to say summarize, and this is very reductive account, like three major you know, colonial legacy that one could think of, First is, of course, the, the reluctance to, to plan or to implement urban planning for the whole city. Yeah, there were some sections of the city, uh, they were planned very carefully, yeah, and they, but they are mostly for, for what we would call uh, European uh, citizens. Yeah. Uh, and, and the rest would be like left alone yeah, under this indirect role where they would be governed by their own kampong uh, leaders. Yeah, so this kind of a partial treatment yeah, leave the cities with lots of gaps. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just juxtaposing you know, two maps. One is from 1938, uh, Batavia. Another one is our 21st century, yeah, uh, Jakarta. Uh, and then the second one, which is interesting, is the acknowledgement of the benefit of self-help housing. Now, this has a lot to do with, with the lack of political will uh, to plan for the whole city to dedicate a public housing for colonial subject, uh, you know, uh, and and also of course lack of financial resources uh, and so on and so forth. So it becomes self help housing become an important component uh, for the Dutch government uh, to continue to to stay on to continue to maintain certain certain order uh, in in the colony. 
Uh, and, and this becomes profoundly interesting because again, it fits with the, the diagram, fits with the whole strategy of role uh, in the colony, yeah, which is the indirect role, yeah, the duality of it, yeah, um, the planned and the unplanned uh, space uh, as a way to govern society. And then the third component uh, is basically the limited kampong improvement. So the kampong improvement project is interesting because that is that is the kind of a, a way of, of forming a communications with colonial subject, yeah, but reluctantly. So we would basically improve certain parts uh, of the city through kampong improvement uh, project. And it was basically aiming at preventing further deterioration of the kampong environment. So it's not really to build anything new there. And as Pauline saw, there was some initiative to, to come up with a new kind of a kampong, new kind of housing. But there was a total lack of knowledge yeah, about how kampong people actually live. There was virtually no available, uh, no data that is available for them to understand you know, who, who are the working class from the kampong. So they have to assume uh, the kampong subjects uh, through this kind of a top-down approach. Yeah, maybe the kampong people would like to live in this way. Therefore, we create a housing, a model housing for them. Yeah, but again, there was no such uh, scale of public housing uh, produced in, in the colony yeah, because of this dualistic governmentality. You know, if the colony, if the colonial subjects are still able to take care of themselves, why don't we just let them do it? Right? We, we intervene when it is absolutely necessary. Yeah. So there's this gap, you know, this, this ambiguities, this reluctance, uh, which then produce the kind of a space that we have uh, inherited uh, from the colonial time. Uh, so now let me move on to the next slides. I don't know why it doesn't move. Um, okay, uh, so the, the fifth one is about, uh, what was the question here? Which initiatives existed and, and can we learn from from them today. Now, the easiest way to do this is to look at uh, our our guru, you know, Johann Silas. You know, what what he thinks about uh, the questions of housing uh, in in colonial and post colonial time. Basically, he said, look, there are only three patterns of housing in the colony. Number one is a privately built housing for private individuals, European. Yeah, who own or rent the new houses. I, I use European quote unquote because it depends on how you turn yourself into European, right? It's not just about the white European. It could be what, what was then called uh, foreign oriental, you know? Uh, so it, it's an ambiguous term, but it was mainly for, for European. Uh, and, and the second pattern of housing, according to Johan Silas, is housing built by companies and governments for their officials. Yeah, for civil servants. So maybe they are considered working class, formal working class. Yeah, we do not know. The third one is self-built housing by kampong dwellers. These are just three major patterns of housing. Yeah, then you could basically ask about Johan Sila. So where is the kampong improvement project? KIP, where would you put that? Now, KIP is simply a kind of a secondary program yeah, of all these number one and number two. So you can't, that is just probably, you know, a, a program, not so, not so much the kind of a, an act, right? Uh, that would allow uh, a kind of a major production of housing. Uh, and so for Johann Silas, you know, this, this duality persists until today. So for him, if you ask him, yeah, he said, well, there are only two domains. One is called the public formal domain, yeah, which is number one and number two. Uh, and then, and then the second domain is the private, you know, informal domain, yeah, which is basically the kampung domain, yeah. Uh, and and if you push him further to ask where is this idea of private informal domain came from, he would say this came from pre-colonial time, you know. So in other words, the self-built housing by kampung dwellers, it can be seen as the kind of a, a pre-colonial Indonesian sort of a, a heritage, yeah. Uh, 
I, I think he's coming very close to, to making that statement. But the colonial time introduced this other domain called the public formal domain. And, and therefore you have this duality yeah, uh, that persists until, until today. So let me move on a little bit. So if we juxtapose uh, this pattern from the colonial time with the pattern from the post-colonial time, you suddenly feel that we are not moving very far from the colonial time. Yeah, so the three patterns of housing provision yeah, from the colonial time it actually continues to operate today. So the first one is the private, privately built housing for upper middle class by real estate companies, yeah, which is actually you know, oops, sorry, uh, which is the number one of the colonial time, okay? Second one, housing for civil servants and former workers by state-owned housing company, which is the Perumnas, yeah, which if you look back, yeah, it was the housing built by companies and government for their officials, right? And the third one is the self-built housing by kampung dwellers with or without the support of KIP, the Kampung Improvement Project, yeah. Uh, and, and so this structure continues until today, but of course, there's some new component, you know, in the post-reform era, where we begin to hear today, there's something called the World Bank's initiative, right, formalizing the informal, informal land, which is something that we can uh, later on uh, discuss. Uh, so if I were to somehow make my final statement over here, uh, and again, I would refer to uh, Johan Silas' sort of a uh, conclusion. Right? Housing issues haven't been resolved. Um, there's no lack of initiatives. Again, this is important. Yeah, There's no lack of initiatives to build so-called public housing for the urban poor, but none of them seems to work, you know, end quote. Yeah? Now, houses that have been produced are quantitatively and qualitatively low. Yeah, and this is a conclusion from, from Johann Silas. So now, as we are probably aware, yeah, the support of the KIP has come to an end uh, and there are reasons to worry. Yeah, as Kampung dwellers are displaced and, and relocated uh, farther and farther away from the city. So under these circumstances, the urban poor have sought, have tried different strategies to claim their rights to live and to work in the city. Yeah, so I think we are looking forward to learning from Elisa, right, who would be able to share with us some of the stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pa Abidin, for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, I think that seeing the problem of public housing in post-colonial context by breaking down the power structure during colonial time has definitely called for a more critical view towards the definition of public housing in both countries. Um, we're asking the question if there is any possibility to build public housing in a real sense, so not only the building. And it also makes me aware of the different social structure at the time, which resulted in people having to solve their own housing problems. So what exactly are these self-help housing? And what are the challenges of housing production in modern days Indonesia? I'm glad to introduce our third speaker, Elisa, to share her insight about these questions. So welcome, uh, Elisa, and I will introduce you to the audience. Um, Elisa Sutanujaya is educated as an architect and took specialization in sustainable and urban development during her master's degree. She has taught in various universities since 2006, including Universitas Pelita Harapan and Universitas Tarumanegara. She is also a co-founder of the Urban Lab at the Graduate School of Planning, Universitas Tarumanegara. She worked as an architect in several firms, including Hassel in Sydney and Design Inc. in Jakarta. Right now, Elisa is the Executive Director of Rujak Center of Urban Studies that she co-founded in 2009. Rujak is a think at tank focused on urban and knowledge issues and advocacy for the right to adequate housing through providing technical assistance, training, housing design for the urban poor, and producing knowledge on kampung and contemporary housing issues in Indonesia. So, Maelisa, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, thank you Amsterdam School Museum and also Melen and uh, Anita for inviting me for the uh, for this discussion, as well as providing a space for me to an opportunity to share my thoughts and our works in at Ruja. Uh, in the beginning of the, I think in the beginning of our meeting, I already mentioned that I'm not a historian. I'm more like an activist uh, uh, or yeah, and I have no, I have little knowledge about Amsterdam School, so. Uh, but the good thing is, uh, uh, previous uh, prior before me, uh, there is Pa Abedin Kusno, which is, and also uh, Pauline who explained a lot about that, and also I learned a lot from the presentation. So following uh, from the presentation of from Pa Abedin, so mm -hmm. I will discuss about oh, is it moving? Ah. So I will discuss about Kampung Kota uh, or urban Kampung, which is embodied as a self-help until today, self-help housing until today. I think it's correspond about, uh, according to our housing statistic, around like 69 or 70% of houses in Indonesia are self-help housing. So, uh, and Kampung Kota is often misunderstood and branded as slums, which is made them always on the margin and under threat of eviction. So Jakarta in 2016 uh, for me was a bizarre year because I witnessed, uh, I think I witnessed four forced eviction in Jakarta, uh, one in Kalijodo in February 2016, one in Aquarium in 2016 on, on April as well, and lastly it Bukit Duri in September 2016. And Bukit Duri was the last kampung evicted in 2016, and then we headed to the uh, to the election year, which is change the narrative of, of Kampung. So for me, it struck me a lot when I saw how 20 excavators in Kampung Aquarium bulldozed quickly demolished the whole, I think 500 buildings of 2000 people within 24 hours, while it took more than four decades or five decades for Kampung Aquarium residents to build those buildings uh, block by block. So yeah. According to the Jakarta Legal Aid, that uh, 2016 was like uh, like a party for forced eviction. There are so many. So forced eviction in Kampung are always, as probably we aware, always part of Jakarta history. We experienced that in uh, in 1990s, in 2015, in 25, 2016, and so on. I think it's also happening in also, of course, in colonial time as well. And uh, I, I have the same map with like, like Pa Abidin, but anyway, so my presentation will be structured around uh, the Kampung uh, itself and how it's related to the universal definition uh, called social habitat production and their challenge in the modern time. And it also a Kampung role in the housing production in Jakarta. And, and of course, due to its habitual challenge and, uh, and of course like forced eviction, so residents in, in, in Kampung also respond to the forced eviction with limited op option for adequate uh, housing they experience daily. So I also propose the role of Kampung as an urban commons and as a non-market and non-capitalistic housing solution. And I will conclude my presentation by providing several housing projects in Kampung, which is built and also ongoing. Uh, as a response and our strategy to avoid forced eviction at the same time uh, as, a, as a way to provide a housing solution as well. And as you can see from this map, uh, Kampung Kota, which is always part of the Indonesian city's history, including Jakarta, uh, the red one actually the what you call as a formal building, while the green one is, uh, is, called, um, uh, is indicating Kampung. And we map that to the current situation, which is also still persists, uh, and, uh, uh, except for several area like Kemayoran and, and some in Ancol. So uh, it is just like a bit of uh, uh, introduction about Kampung. So I kind of like combine this, uh, how can I say, expert uh, definition about Kampung. But this is like the conclusion. Uh, I more like conclude Kampung as a socially produced and non-market settlement located in the strategic urban area, as you can see from the map. And most of the time it is high density and doesn't have land tenure. And they often 
contains a spectrum of ethnic diversity and also level of income, different income, and often have uh, included social structure coming from the original uh, village uh, where they, they come from, or rural area or elsewhere. So, uh, and some expert like Helga Leitner and Eric Shepard once told me that it, they also emphasize the the significance of kampung as a space to med meditate on um, oh, sorry mediate practice of commoning like like how you make a space as a, as a commons which is except the more uh, is, is, is a totally different from the capitalist social relation and they also further emphasize uh, how kampung provide lively support uh, to the resident itself uh, through this kind of activities like gotong royong or local social support or arisan and also simply uh, togetherness. And, and kampung also uh, and universally addressed as social habit, uh, production of habitat. Uh, this could be oversimplified uh, uh, example, but I like to put this image every time I try to explain about kampung, uh, because uh, apparently we are not that. I mean, kampung is not that unique uh, as a as a as a form of habitat. So the like the the left one is uh, in Bikini in Jakarta, and the central one actually in Tokyo, and the last one is in Mumbai. It's kind of like indicating how they treat street uh, where they also put their private space uh, private belonging and how they kind of like utilize space uh, how uh, I have the similar uh, situation as well and and social habitat so social production of habitat actually already acknowledged in new urban agenda uh, from the habitat tree uh, so we can also understood it as a process which generate living space urban component and housing carry out under the control of self producer and other social agents acting without profitable purposes so I I, I I I want to make sure that I don't misread it. So I I read it actually from uh, uh from from the from the uh, new urban agenda, and uh, so as a conclusion, uh, social habitat uh, actually is not a finished product. It's a process. Uh, it's a it's a social and cultural product rather than a merchandise or a product uh, or or or, or, a, or a property. And in fact, and how we in, inhabiting it actually is not about, uh, not mere about object of exchange. It's also have a social participation uh, in, in the diverse housing production phase, including planning, construction, distribution, and use, including the financial, uh, how to finance uh, uh, the, the habitat as well. But unfortunately, uh, Pak Abidin already mentioned about the duality and everything. So the distinctness of Kampung was never fully understood. Uh, and I assume that this is also because of the duality itself. Uh, so the one with power, like, like the city planner or the government with city planning uh, agencies, uh, through their policy, they reduce the diversity of a dynamic and uh, uh, resourceful nature of Kampung into singular conception of this kind of city planning. So their existence, like, like for example, in the left side of the map, simply ignored by the city planning process. So when we map the current situation of Kampung Muara Angke with the city planning in 2014 uh, for the detailed plan, apparently all the low houses is located on the water. Uh, most of the houses located on the water. So that's how, uh, how the city planning, uh, city planning agency treat uh, Kampung as a as a as a way to provide something that utilize uh, that useful for the city rather than acknowledging the kampung itself. So, uh, what government believe as solution for housing, including the kampung, actually this single and limited uh, solution, which is called Rusunawa. Until today, Jakarta have twenty nine thousand uh, Rusunawa unit. Uh, Rusunawa is a public rental flat. Uh, which is targeting uh, Kampung residents. Uh, so after eviction, they, uh, the government uh, tend to move them to the Rusunawa, which is uh, far away uh, from the city center or far away from their or, uh, origin. So uh, the idea of the Rusunawa actually is also not, uh, is also part of the idea or image of the global city situation where, uh, where Kampung consider as not, uh, as not, uh, as not is considered not as a modern enough. 
so they prefer to have these housing blocks and uh, and and provide them as a housing uh, for the kampung residents. So despite uh, having numerous improvement program in kampung, so like like the uh, like the kampung improvement program like five decades ago in 1969, which is financed by World Bank, and it's already uh, have uh, implemented almost. Uh, in the whole Jakarta, like I think 20% of Jakarta urban area, where uh, which is targeted 25% of the population at that time, but the slumness uh, or, or the condition, the degradation of the condition uh, is uh, in Kampung still persists, and the Kampung is still easily land grab or is is, is still easily uh, affected due to the condition, and that's when we found out because after the all kind of uh, this situation, uh, this improvement or campus improvement program, the government never really addressed the agrarian problem or agrarian question in Kampung. So until today, uh, so this is the map uh, about the agrarian situation in Kampung, which is I forgot to translate to English. Sorry. So the red one actually Kampung with no uh, with no clear uh, with no with with uh, with agrarian problem because they they haven't really been identified or certified yet while the 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 blue one actually kampung uh, where the uh, uh, building rights uh, uh, certificate is located usually it's by it by by the developers or by by company so there is also indicating the agrarian conflict in that kampung as well so so that's why the slumness uh, the degradation the eviction still continue until today because uh, never uh, uh, never before in the past we addressed the agrarian problem in Kampung. So uh, reflecting from the vicious cycle in Kampung in relation to the notion of planning, agrarian problem, uh, I would like to share my reflection uh, and our advocacy in housing rights and through the community planning program with Kampung residents. So I start with the famous quote from David Harvey, uh, Right to the City. The right to the city is far more than individual liberty to access urban resources is the right to change ourselves by changing the city. So that's what we going to, that's what we do actually. We try to change ourselves by changing the city. Uh, this means including changing our habitat, our kampung as well. But that's our right as a residents, not the government rights, uh, not only uh, government rights. So it's, it's more of a common rather than individual rights since the transformation in, inevitably depends upon the exercise of collective power uh, to reshape uh, the process of urbanization. So that's basically our uh, basic idea uh, to, uh, when we do this. And at the same time, we also see as a, a kampung as a commoning uh, process, uh, which is uh, totally uh, uh, treat housing not necessarily as a commodity, but also as a place of living and also social economic production. So. Uh, and, and the production and process that we have going through in Kampung over the past, uh, the past decades, actually the opposite of the commodification of housing. So we call it as a commoning process, which is including uh, the mode of production, um, managing resources in the Kampung, including land, housing, and finance. Uh, this is also articulate pluralistic account of Kampung as urban commons in order to provide framework and set tools to open up the possibility for more inclusive and suitable uh, form of city making. So these three Kampungs uh, located in three different area have three different uh, uh, background, geographical condition and etc. But, uh, but we have uh, also have three different tactics here. Like in Kampung Aquarium, we try to rebuild of course, after eviction, Kampung Muarake, we tried to consolidate, consolidate and reblocking and also rebuild it as well. And in Kampung Marlina, we tried to repair and upgrade as a, as a housing solution. So despite the difference in a sense of geography, history, social, economic background, and, and etc., actually we utilize the same commoning tactic, which, which is related to how we organize, which is a, a Kampung cooperative, how we design, which is a community planning, with, uh, including the implementation, and how we finance, which is a mixed financing from the resident, philanthropic government, including the left infrastructure levy, a grant revolving fund, and who owns the land, which is the most important one. Uh, we put uh, the idea of community land trust, which is also happening in these uh, two kampungs. 
So the first one is a Kampung Aquarium, which is affected in 2016. So, uh, this one, uh, of course, uh, we 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 it's we utilize the design as a as a way uh, to as a, and also as a means to communicate and also to unify the residents. What is your common future? Uh, uh, we try to identify their needs and also try to identify what connect them as a community, as a kampung, and also what can they be done together as a for the future. So this is a ex house ex house ex-housing process of the community uh, uh, process in, uh, uh, from 2016 to uh, 2017 until actually until today or including until today. So, and, uh, and, and then we also, uh, since it's also, uh, uh, it will be financed, uh, sorry, it financed by the government. So there's a uh, have to be involved uh, the government, which is also the governor and ho uh, uh, housing agency, which is a totally different model from the public rental flats that earlier we usually when the government uh, finance and uh, design and build the project without uh, community involvement. So this is the process while the construction uh, process, uh, during the, under the construction. The community also observes uh, uh, the construction process, including make sure all the materials, uh, all, all, all the specification are correct according to the drawings. Uh, and uh, they, they actively engage uh, in the, in the, uh, in the manage, uh, construction management meeting every week. So this is how they explain uh, utilizing space when they are under uh, construction, uh, and they uh, they tend to see us. Uh, uh, they also tend to see and identify a specific uh, area in the building as a as a common space. Like for example, stairs is not necessarily only just as a stairs, but also as a public space as well. So this is uh, from before and and uh, after uh, before eviction, and then in uh, August twenty twenty one. And then in 2022, when we have four blocks, uh, which is uh, accommodated, accommodating around like 240 families in the future. So yeah, and then uh, the model of Kampung Aquarium is not only uh, benefiting uh, one Kampung, but also benefiting other Kampung, which is Kampung Kunir, Kampung Bukit Duri in Cakung, and Kampung Bayam, which, uh, which is following the same model uh, Three of them actually the same kampung who also got affected uh, in the past and then uh, rebuilt. Uh, despite kampung bayam actually have a uh, have a, right now is undergoing some problem with the developers. But uh, one Aisha? thing that uh, yeah, uh, can you finish in five minutes? Okay, sorry. Uh, so one thing that in, uh, one thing that important in this process is how the cooperative taking uh, active role, uh, especially in signing agreement with the provincial government, and how also in transitioning uh, the building ownership and building management from the uh, from the provincial government to the cooperative as well, including uh, collecting fund uh, to uh, to pay uh, the uh, the the rental for the land. Uh, by themselves independently. So yeah, another one is the Muara Angke, which is uh, always under threat of eviction uh, from 40 years ago until today. Uh, and, and, but we took the opportunity uh, of the uh, national strategic project to propose something to the national government and provincial government. So and also took the opportunity of the uh, of the one of the national government uh, program called land consolidation, and this is how we uh, consolidate ourselves and make the kampung uh, divide the uh, make the kampung as a, as a, as a unified habitat rather than a sing, a single individual land. So uh, in this uh, in this pro process, actually, some residents uh, uh, who has more land uh, agree to reduce uh, their houses uh, into sm uh, to smaller size, while the one without uh, uh, or limited uh, space uh, they have more spaces uh, because of the transfer of uh, of space, and it's a combination between. Uh, 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 and I landed houses and also a uh, vertical kampung. So yeah, uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, now it's on the on the process with with Ministry of Agrarian and Special Planning. Hopefully, 
uh, it will be speed up uh, because we have to. We still have to wait for the governor uh, to sign like like uh, like a permit uh, to to start the consolidation process. So another one is another uh, different tactic to uh, to. Sorry, uh, another one in Kampung Malina, which is also in, uh, in North Jakarta, is a uh, is a kampung that having a uh, environmental degradation. Uh, so this is more like a tactic to revitalize the kampung uh, through the uh, improvement program or upgrading project. So uh, this is the like like the the design guideline that we conduct together with the community. Uh, and uh, this is one of the alleys that we uh, agreed to start from uh, together with the communities. This is all co-op based and financed by the residents and, and uh, have a, a part partially uh, received a grant and funding from, from BASNAS uh, and also from Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. And this is also a revolving fund as well. So you start with one houses and then move to another houses. When uh, when when the uh, residents uh, saving is enough to cover uh, twenty percent or thirty percent of the whole construction, so uh, this is the before uh, condition and this is the process and 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 the, the selection of contractors the uh, and the, and also the uh, management of construction is handled by cooperative together with the owner uh, and this is uh, the is. This is one of the improvement that we uh, put in every houses, uh, which is a lighting well and also a cross circulation, uh, because it's a, Marina is very dense uh, uh, with limited uh, space for lighting. So that's why we uh, incorporated in the design to make sure enough lighting and air circulation. So the this is also the after uh, picture and the, the houses behind actually. Uh, uh, you can see what uh, in the before the uh, before the repair is uh, just like like what happened in the back of the uh, in the background and the, the 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 new one actually what happened here. So this also improved a lot uh, a lot uh, not only uh, uh, the condition and also the hygiene, but at the same time providing the uh, economic space on the ground, uh, which is warung uh, uh, inside the inside the housing as well, which is uh, improve the uh, not only living condition but also economic uh, condition of the residents. So I guess that's the end of my slides. I give it back to you, uh, Anita. All right. Um, thank you, Ma Elisa, for the interesting presentation. Uh, it is always so great to see how these initiatives has enabled the citizen to uh, claim their own rights and have their own agency in providing housing for their own. Um, I'm also sure that all of us here has gained more understanding about Kampung Kota and its role to provide so many functions in society and not only as a dwelling for the people, but also provide many social functions as an alternative to the uh, capitalistic housing models. So um, for those interested to know more about this and to ask questions to all, all of our speakers, please don't hesitate to put your question in the chat box. And now I'd like to invite our commentators to give their remarks or questions about the presentations. Uh, so please welcome Rizky Kalebos and Ketia Sopandi. Right. All right. Yeah. So uh, Rizky Kalebos is a city planner and online storyteller for the Ned from the Netherlands with roots in Indonesia. During his urban planning studies, he has researched the lasting effects of colonial city planning on contemporary Jakarta. And he uses social media to share his view as the city planner on the colonial history of both Indonesia and Dutch cities and their legacies. So Rizky, after listening to the presentations, what do you think about this topic? And do you have any questions and remarks? Um, yeah, well, um, for my own research during my master's thesis, I used the sources of uh, Pauline and pa Abidin and uh, also Fred Colomban. So I'm very familiar with all the content um, and what stands out for me is um, in the colonial era there was a dualism in uh, government so you had the European government and the indigenous government and they didn't interfere um, 
so the indigenous government had jurisdiction over the indi indigenous municipality. Um, and also um, the maps of um, the division between kampongs and European neighborhoods uh, still resonate to today. And that was actually one of my uh, starting points of my thesis. So it's funny to uh, see that back in uh, both the presentations. Um, yeah, and I think also the difference in the situations in the Netherlands and the Dutch East Indies is the, the form of governance, um, where one is more successful in public housing and the other isn't. Um, and questions, because I wrote down the questions. Um, because during my own research, I wanted to know what the indigenous governance, governance was and what their capability was. Um, but why, what I found in my own research was, um, or the question I have right now is, um, during the colonial times, the governance was like split up, like there were two types of governance. But I also have read um, about the influence of uh, Tamrin in the governance and the Kampung improvement. Maybe Pa Abidin can elaborate on what role Tamrin had in the Kampung improvement. Oh, yeah. Abidin. Oh, uh, should I respond now or are we waiting for all the points to come up? Do you have I, any I, other question, Rizky? Uh, yeah, my other question yeah. is um, about the, the last presentation by Ibu Elisa. Um, because um, most of the kampungs uh, mentioned are on the northern coast of Jakarta and I wondered um, how sustainable they are with the environmental issues of the sea rising and the land sinking and how vulnerable they are. Okay. So maybe uh, we can and uh, we can answer the first question first. With Paadin Kusno, the role of Tamrin in the Kampung Improvement Program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Kai. I think it would be really important uh, for anyone who is currently doing a research, say on colonial Indonesia and the housing question to start to focus on, on Tamrin. There's hardly any sort of a major analysis on, on Tamrin. There are, there are some works that have been done, but not a kind of a full account, you know, on what we call, uh, Tamrin and the role of the house, the, the city council, uh, especially uh, from the perspective of, from the local perspective. Uh, what I remember, and that has been a while when I did some research on, on, on the city hall, right, from the colonial time until, until the post-colonial era, uh, was that I think Tamrin was pretty much disappointed or frustrated uh, by not only the lack of commitment to put forward uh, the, the questions of, of improving uh, the housing situation, including the kampong uh, of the indigenous population, uh, but he just felt like the whole structure of the city council is not, is not genuinely trying to improve uh, the local condition. It is really trying to have some representative uh, from someone like himself. And he himself is not quite a kampong dweller. He's, he's quite an elite uh, sort of a, a person uh, in, in the set of a colonial uh, hierarchy, but he has a, a strong structure of feeling uh, to represent the kampong folks. Um, and I have a feeling, do I have to check again uh, the data? I think he, in the end, gave up. You know, he just basically leave the, the city council out of frustration. Yeah, so obviously that really suggests that there was some good push for, for more kampong improvement. Uh, but again, it is just not enough. 
to really allow the major kampong improvement to move from what is considered as just a, a supplementary program into a kind of a, a main program of, of the colonial you know, housing situation. Kampong improvement project is just a secondary, it's just a supplement of, of the larger initiatives when it comes to the housing questions. Yeah, but thank you, Kai, you just bring this uh, to everyone's consciousness about the importance of, again, looking at, you know, what Tambrin did and what the city council and Tambrin have done to each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think this, uh, your answer, you also answer a question from uh, Yunita Dwi Adisa Putri, our audience. Uh, she asked about how should we approach the kampung phenomena and uh, that also touch upon this question but uh, you need to feel free to uh, ask more if you need more um, explanation so we're now moving to Mba Elisa um, would you like to answer the question from Rizky about the sustainability of the uh, northern um, northern Jakarta's village or kampung yeah, uh, the reason why we insist to do upgrading by ourselves or even uh, proposing the land consolidation uh, in Muara Anke is also to address the environmental issues there. So like in Muara Anke, they're having problem with uh, land subsidence uh, at the same time uh, with, uh, uh, I forgot the name, rob, like, like flooding from the sea. <laughs> Uh, so uh, that's why we 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 believe that one of the one of the way to address it as a as a as a as a effectively and also uh, give a give a community like a, a mandate uh, to sort of manage their own is through this uh, uh, land consolidation process. But the difference with the land consolidation process uh, uh, from the government usually is a top-down policy, but this one is a design by the community. Uh, they 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 are the one who uh, locate where the back, where the dike going to be uh, because they are mostly a fish of fox and where the dry where they dry the fish and etc. and where they put the 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 housing uh, the rental housing the uh, sorry not rent uh, the the vertical kampung. Uh, and but we as a we as a architect who help them uh, provide them like kind of like more like oh this area is suitable for the vertical kampung because uh, they have a tendency to uh, history a uh, low tendency of uh, land subsidence rather than other area and this area is more suitable for for other thing because uh, uh, or uh, you have to build dike over there because uh, you know in order to uh, help you uh, avoid the uh, 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 for the flooding, uh, tidal, uh, tidal flooding. So actually uh, that's the strategy for the environmental degradation. Uh, while, uh, this, uh, while for the Kampung Marlina actually is a strategy uh, to, uh, to address or to adapt uh, with the current uh, climate crisis because of the hotness, uh, the urban heat island. So that's why we pushed uh, uh, we put that kind of uh, in uh, this kind of design to have this uh, better air circulation and etc. So yeah, I hope it makes sense to you. <laughs> yeah. Are are you satisfied, Risky? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, moving on to Pasutiadi. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. But uh, um, apologize first. I think I need to shut down my video because my bandwidth is so low. Allow me to yeah. speak uh, through, through voice only. <laughs> I actually would just want to uh, highlight few few in um uh, few uh, insights that I I took from from the presentation. Very good presentations. Very impressive, and it's very uncommon to to have a very broad and deep coverage in a relatively short duration a webinar. Uh, I remember uh, when I uh, read uh, uh, Professor Abidin Kusno's book uh, about the uh, 
post independence uh, housing housing situation in Indonesia. And also I uh, read about one example that uh, put up by, by Professor Colombin about uh, on his book, Hanja Construction. Uh, he shows out that in reality, the effort to provide cheap, affordable housing is far from, from simple, actually. Yes, uh, it's uh, we, we agree about that. But it's very interesting. It seems very dynamic, lively, but also at the same time, tricky, chaotic, and uh, kind of intertwining. He describes uh, several interesting housing experiments, such as the, the use of ampasit, the cold ampasit beton in Bandung, uh, uh, by a uh, firm uh, for uh, Klein Woning Bow in 1939 in Bandung. It's very interesting uh, experiment actually using waste material from sugarcane as an aggregate for concrete, uh, which is, is proven to be a good fire retardant uh, and also lightweight, easy to make, and termite proof. But one of these director, Paul Defa, this is the plot twist of this uh, story was also one of the director of the Department of Land and Housing in Bandung Municipality. So it's actually he's, um, walking on the double track. <laughs> and and uh, interestingly, such position is not difficult to imagine for us that he can easily use his position to benefit his own company. And one can imagine private developers can exercise profound impact on cities by expanding the, the sites, uh, expanding the city, practicing land speculation, absorbing subsidies and infrastructural uh, fundings. Um, by, by this uh, description, we can actually see the positive sides, but actually we are, uh, see potential problems that have been, uh, been uh, 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 accompanying our, our uh, housing history throughout the century. Uh, on the positive side, also we have this uh, new European settlements where uh, can be exemplary uh, case studies as a as planned urban expansion with significantly enlarged Indonesian cities, not just expanding, but uh, and becomes a genetic pattern of development to existing characteristic of uh, uh, Indonesian cities, was appreciated actually by current urban uh, conservation regime uh, today. And uh, these new settlements were sort of urban in character, sparsely built. Mas Tiadi? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Are you able to... Um... Continue with your connection. Sorry. Hi, I'm back. Yeah, great. Yeah, sorry, it's very bad infrastructure for my housing here. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm adding another uh, uh another uh, case study that can we we, we can reflect upon. Uh, I've been reading the book by recently published by Maurice Mirwick about the history of plague in Java. He said in the book actually the 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 reaction of the colonial government towards the 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 plague epidemic in in the Dutch East Indies has been profoundly changing the way that we see uh settlements buildings uh building tradition and in some sense in many sense actually uh, even more than the housing uh uh act or, or or programs by the government itself uh, such as the uh, it can reach the non-European neighborhoods um, and even challenging the tradition that uh, how the, the native build their buildings and, and even influencing the town planning paradigm itself. The anti-play campaign left a lasting stigma. Uh, in example, to bump, uh, uh, we begin consider bamboo as inferior building material after that uh, associated with temporal and per, uh, and primitive uses, uh, it was stigmatized as a, a breeding pl a place for, for permits that spread the disease. And it also produced a, a norm uh, of, of, of spacing and building setbacks 
which were also becoming the generic norm to all neighborhoods, not only to Europeans. So it applies, uh, setbacks now are still enforced to, to traditionally tight neighborhoods, such as the China, Chinatowns, uh, creating conservation legal issues up to today. So I'm uh, bringing up uh, these examples be, uh, because it fits to, to what uh, Pauline and also uh, Pa Abidin and even Elisa's uh, presentation about uh, what is the problem with our housing uh, question, housing issues, and it was a multi-dimensional kind of thing. And uh, it's intertwined, everything together. So I'm not uh, raising question, but actually I'm just adding a few uh, I assume that as as interesting uh, examples and case studies to to reflect upon. Okay, thank you, Anita. Thank you, pa Pastiadi. Um, yeah, I've seen that um we have a lot of questions already. Uh, for Pauline, um, there's a question from Amanda Pragit Pragita. Um, so she basically asked that there's a two part of the question. The first one is that. Um, is there any involvement of the local dwellers or native in designing social housing, whether in colonial era and current situation? Is the design process participatory? And if yes, how to approach the community? So she's asking if there is a participatory design process um, in Dutch East Indies during colonial time and mm -hmm. recent time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for recent time, um, I think Elisa's um, uh, presentation is a perfect illustration yeah. of how participatory projects work. She, I mean, she actually shows images with the people working with the designers. So, uh, but I so I'd gladly pass that one on to Elisa. But um, as far as the colonial colonial times were concerned, that's why I was sort of hellbound in showing you those. Um, demonstrating you, you, you these three projects in uh, Batavia slash Jakarta Samarang and Maidan because um, initially they weren't and then the designers ran into the problem that clearly they didn't understand what people needed to, to just summarize what the problem was and therefore learning from the experiences um, from other local councils and also meeting up with professional colleagues in numerous conferences that were organized on an annual basis and learning from experiences in other cities. That's why the Maidan local council in 1920 decided to go for a more participatory uh, approach and start with a pilot project to, to check whether that approach would go down better and result in happier people basically and they ultimately the people the local people who were involved and in participated in the project were happier people because one of the one out of the four compounds that was designed through this method were actually replaced from another so there were four compounds and one group was replaced from one compound to a new site and the people that were moved to this other side, to this new compound, where they were involved in the development, were asked to name the compound. And they named it Sido Dadi, which allegedly are not a local, I don't speak the local language. But apparently it means we managed, we were successful, we did it, we succeeded, which would suggest that people were happy in the process. So is the the Kampung Sidodadi is still here up until oh, now? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I visited yeah. So some ten a... years ago with a with a local uh, film director, and she was she was so surprised not only the fact that it was still there, but the quality, the the level of green. You could see people. There had been some planning, some planning thoughts were spent on creating this compound because there were obviously and very um there were open spaces that were still kept open where people could you know exercise sports or hang out together so yeah it's still there and they're amazingly green and quiet all right um i'm gonna move on to a question from aski uh also to pauline mm -hmm. um he asked that uh is the dutch housing act 
um, in Dutch East Indies also uh, because of the also forced by the industrial revolution. Oh, the, the, uh, the just thinking. like in the, hmm. the Netherlands, yeah. Well, yeah, the, the problems in cities in the Netherlands and the Dutch East Indies were similar in that all of a sudden, well, over a short period of time, that is, a lot of people migrated from the countryside into the city. That was similar in Indonesia. The reason in Indonesia was very much that towards the end of the 19th century, private um, entrepreneurs saw more opportunities for um, um, to, to start up their own businesses. And they very often started up businesses in the cities or goods or produce needed to be transported from the countryside to the city. So that it wasn't a total parallel and it all happened a little bit later, but it, there, are, there are similarities, yeah, to why all of a sudden the whole housing issue became an issue. And that was to do with public health. It's, it's also, you, you need to remember that the, the whole housing issue was very much connected to public health. That was a very mm -hmm. important reason. You needed people to be healthy. And therefore, yeah, it was, um, yeah, the, the dichotomy in the administration, because initially the Dutch ruled over what they considered European parts of the city and they, the uh, kampung dwellers were, were given administrative autonomy, but of course cities or, yeah, um, illnesses don't stop at administrative borders. So then they needed to sort out how do we deal with this system? It doesn't work like this. And, uh, yeah, and a, a more holistic approach to urban planning then apparent then gradually became more of a thing. Mm. And he also asked another question about um, the the public housing that create that was created in the Netherlands. It mm -hmm. was quite luxury and uh, uh, with, a, with a bigger size. So how do they make it cheaper? And what is the strategy to make it more affordable? and succeed in the Netherlands? Yeah, well, well, that was always a challenge all in the Netherlands and the same challenge in, the, in Indonesia because they tried the same um, business model in, in the Dutch East in, in colonial times as well, where, for example, the municipality would participate um, for a certain percentage. So they would um, establish these limited companies, as they're called in English, in Dutch they're called NVs, naamloze vennootschappen. Um, it was complicated uh, because a, a true business model never worked. That's why in Indonesia they tried, but they hardly ever succeeded because money was so tight. And what they, what you always, what any any housing public housing scheme did was they differentiated different houses. So there were different houses, different sizes rooms, uh, different materials, and related to that were different rents. So there was an entire, so I think in, in the Maidan scheme for these four kampongs, I think they had like 28 different sizes of houses with additional, with um, uh, corresponding prices, rents attached to them. But it was, it was a big jigsaw to figure it out. And it was never financially profitable. It always need, needed extra money. Which is why what Abidin pointed out, if the government doesn't support it, it then becomes a problem because you need, yeah, public money. But how do governments get money? Through tax. And how do you tax? Who do you tax? So it's it's a very intertwined um, um, challenge to solve. All right. Um, and then moving on, there's a question for by Elisa. Um, so how to pursue the dwellers who used to live in landed houses to live in vertical housing? Is there different habit impacting to the design from those affected people from different areas? So how do you um, make sure that they want to move into the new houses? Uh, so uh, actually, that's, uh, that's why we have to do the community planning, because there's where the negotiation take place, the learning process and unlearning process also taking place as well. So for example, when you come or when you have the situation with the city planning, uh, 
uh, ordinance that uh, only allow you to build certain thing, then you have to kind of like negotiate or mitigate with that. Like for example, with Kampung Aquarium, uh, they have to aware that uh, there is a current uh, spatial uh, regulation that only allow them to build only 50% uh, of the land. So we explain to them, yes, you can still live on the landed house, but then you have to change the law and then it take a longer process. If you build as, uh, as you built as before, probably you will get evicted again. So then they argue back and then they, we also propose to change the city planning ordinance for that one as well, because there's a mechanism to allow that as well. So that's uh, the whole messy process uh, of the community planning happening. And that's why uh, when they come out with the same knowledge and same information and undergoing the understanding the technical difficulties and all those things, they can also uh, make, a, uh, make a decision based on that, uh, that situation. So uh, by informing those kind of uh, limitation and also uh, strength and weakness of the, the kind of choices, so they allow uh, or they uh, they willing to change their habitat, you know, from the landed house to the uh, uh, to the vertical kampung. So, uh, but within the government system, usually you you're not allowing them to have those kind of process. So it's just only one solution, and that's it. So uh, at the end of the day, they're still moving to the uh, vertical housing. But the process how to move them, like the process how they acknowledge or making up decision is totally different. So I guess that's we uh, we 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 put that uh, into into something that more matters than the housing design itself. And, and after they agree to move to vertical housing, then the the uh, the uh, the design process is much more easier. They even come out with making a model one by one model, like making a simulation one by one and making a fake wall and everything. And they 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 decorate and they they modify the space and they uh, they at the end of the day uh, they come out with their own design and we just only help them facilitate. So I think the the initial process is the most important process is in the beginning when they. Uh, make up their decision and how they come up with the decision. Yeah, it's it's, it's very interesting because in the end, uh, the process of building uh, housing for people is not just like the physical building, but also the process of uh, inviting everyone to really know what they need. So uh, I think this will be the last question because we are running out of time to uh, Abidin Kusno. Um, yeah, it's a, a question about uh, housing projects of Thomas Karsten. Like um, um, the, you said the social housing in colonial times was not only too, too little, but also not aware of living habits of the indigenous people. So what do you think of the housing projects of Karsten? Um, is it the same applies to his design? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think if we remember Pauline's uh, presentations uh, about Carsten's uh, sort of uh, housing design, I think one is in uh, Malaten, is that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think, and there are, there are also, of course, uh, housing for what we would call, you know, middle class, upper middle class or, or government uh, uh, civil servants. Um, I think what is interesting about Carsten, and this is not uniquely Carsten, the whole colonial uh, approach to the colony, not just the Dutch, it includes the French, it includes uh, other empire as well. They normally have two kinds of uh, ideas uh, to, to produce space in the colony. One is to, to basically modernize the place. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other approach, uh, is is what is called uh, techno cosmopolitanism, which is to assume what is called local culture, and using local culture as a way to produce space, and and that came out of all these architectural experiments. Not so much on housing because they just didn't have any opportunity to to design public housing as we know it uh, in 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 Netherlands. 
they have some architectural projects, public buildings, uh, universities, uh, religious buildings, uh, market, central market, and so on and so forth. They actually study what they assume to be indigenous uh, cultural tradition, if not the building tradition. So there's an assumption of culture. That doesn't necessarily mean that that was really the cultures of, of uh, the indigenous population. It was just an assumption of culture. There's a kind of a belief that, you know, you have to allow this culture, at least at the level of, of images and, and maybe the assumptions of certain spaces. Uh, and, and you want to cultivate that, but you want to show that, in fact, this local culture can, can also be modernized, can also be made architectural. Yeah. Uh, so we can't say that they are not sensitive. They are just using the modernist approach top down. They do try to do something from bottom up. But it is all their own assumption. There's a whole orientalist paradigm behind, you know, uh, from Meklen Pond, including Carson as well. There was some part of what they call indigenous spiritual domain that we, the Dutch, must not try to enter. But we can cultivate that. We can allow that to be, to be ennobled. We can allow that to play a certain role, but we should not change it. And and that also applies to to Carson's. Uh, way of thinking about Kampong Improvement Project as well. He has a disagreement with with Tilema. Tilema is a is a straight modernizer. You know, he just think that well, you just have to build a new Kampong. That's it, with all kind of a public health criteria. And Karsten is a bit more, you know, what we might call a good orientalist. You know, he said, no, 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 uh, you can fix some appearances, but you you should retain some domain that should be reserved only for the indigenous populations to cultivate themselves. And, and that you can argue that is in fact the ideological approach of colonial government when you have not enough money to upgrade things. You say, well, you know, we can only upgrade certain appearances, certain parts of, of your environment. But there's that whole assumption, there's a whole divisions between what is called the material uh, modernizations and and also the spiritual domain that you are you're not supposed to touch. Um, so mm. your question become pretty interesting, you know. But I I wouldn't assume that say Carsten has designed something really based on on Indonesian culture. It is his assumption about Kampung culture. Yeah, it, it was not the era where we can let. That whole participatory approach, you know, to to create kampung, there was no such privilege. There was no such time. They were all colonial subjects. You know, you don't have money even to provide any improvement. How could you provide facilities for all kind of consultations? And time is of the essence. And and they actually, in fact, have no time even to go to kampung to compile data. They do some mapping, and then by the time the mapping was completed, they realized it was already outdated. Because, because of the growth of Kampung was so fast, okay? Uh, so we have to be very careful with, you know, Karsten being, being uh, yeah, very sensitive to a Indonesian cancer. That was all true, but that was also part, part of the whole colonial approach to the colony as well. If you cannot modernize the colony, then you use some of their own culture as a way to modernize themselves. And that means that you must not intervene fully. And, and that is why, no public housing in some way is a strategy of rule. It's, it's not any lack of, of uh, governmentality. It is just the way of governing. Yeah. So that thank would be you, my, my uh, best. Thank you, Pa Abidin. Um, so there's then definitely, there is good intention there, but uh, somehow it's um, in a, very difficult time and situation. So that's why I feel so fortunate, fortunate uh, to be here today to listen to um, all the presentations here by Pauline um, with all the, the history uh, of public housing in the Netherlands, Indonesia that has given us uh, a basic of understanding of what is happening right now. And then moving on to Pa Abidin, uh, gi giving us um, a very critical view of um, a post-colonial um, view, what is happening in a colonial situation, and then moving on to 
um, Elisa to finish it with a very optimistic um, presentation of how we actually can do something uh, that we just have to uh, work together to reach this um, a better future. So um, I think uh, I'd like to, yeah, it's, it's, it's already finished our time, but uh, maybe from the speakers and commentators, if you would like to say something um, to close this session. Um, so we start from uh, Rizky, would you like to say something? We have a, a, a comment from the from also from the audience. Like, do you have some advice for the future architects? So maybe uh, that will be a good start. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So please, um, what do you think about this session? Risky? Oh, uh, the session. Uh, yeah, it's very yes. informative, and uh, I learned new things. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so Pasatiadi, are you still here? Okay. I think you still have some um issue with connection. Um yeah. Pauline, would you like to have remarks? Yeah, I'm um Curiously awaiting a new exhibition. I can see a new exhibition coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, okay, so Pak Abidin. Okay, I, I think one one topic is missing in, in, in our dis discussion, which is the current state of public housing in the Netherlands. You know, so what are the new initiatives and then what have been the challenges? Um, and and with that, we could actually begin to think about, say, the current approaches to social housing in Indonesia, uh, especially the grassroots sort of a movement uh, that Elisa has shared with us. Right? Say, in Netherlands, do you see something like this? Uh, so I was just wondering about the whole housing association in, in the Netherlands, which was really an important component of, of housing provision, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what is that, that housing association? Is that something similar to, to what Elisa uh, and, and her group is trying to, to do, right? Uh, so I think that kind of exchange would be really interesting. We can then begin to learn about about contemporary challenges rather than reflecting back onto the past onto the past yeah yeah definitely um yeah so that part is missing <laughs> but it's okay i mean next time <laughs> yeah we can add one more session perhaps <laughs> uh and my elisa please yeah actually uh so not really answering Pak Abidin, but actually when we uh, study about community land trust, cooperative housing, and et cetera, actually we're looking into uh, what European did, like like in Berlin or like in even like in London, where the where where the little more uh, how can I say neoliberal housing situation worse than in Indonesia. So we saw uh, we try to see what happened in the grassroots as well. So yeah, maybe you can add more in the new exhibition, Tita. <laughs> but anyway, actually, I learned a lot from uh, Ibu Pauline. Actually, how we uh, not really learning from the history. Like when as I know about the Kampung Kampung Taman Sari because one of the uh, one of our interns actually researched about Kampung Taman Sari and he produced a, a, a thesis on that. So I become aware about that and how it's also failed and how is also uh, try uh, how the government also tried to do the same thing by deciding something that not really coming from the people and they keep 
making it the same mistake again and and how uh, and how the strategy also the same uh, from the past so it just uh, really like a vicious cycle and uh, uh we try to i'm i'm just afraid that what we uh, what we doing it now as a as an architect i mean like from rujak or from urban poor consortium or other collaborators in this project i'm afraid that we uh, the next generation have to do the same thing again because of this vicious cycle so hopefully next generation is much more uh, learning from the past mistake, from my mistake or from our mistake. So they got better in the future, <laughs> better and luck in the future. Uh, but so yeah, that's my hope. So I I, I also happy that many uh, 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 some architects also come and asking about uh, how to do how to do the how to convince the. Uh, the residents, so uh, it also means that uh, as an architect, you, uh, starting from now, you also have to listen, not only the client who pay you, but also the community members cannot pay you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the, uh, that's my last comment. <laughs> Thank you. I think it will be a great idea if you can start a platform of um, both uh, Dutch and Indonesian architects to share all these resources because we have so much more to um, talk about. But yeah, um, I think those remarks has perfectly sums up our discussion today. Um, thank you again to our great panelists today. Pauline Kain van Rosmalen, Abidin Kusno, Elisa Sutanujaya, Rizky Kalobos, and Setiadi Sopandi for sharing with us your time and thoughts. Thank you to all Hedgekit team for supporting this discussion. And of course, thank you to our wonderful audience today. Uh, I hope this will not be the last time for us to having this kind of discussion. So I will see you all in the future. And for now, I'll give the floor back to Mela. Yes, thank you, Anita, for uh, for wrapping it up so nicely. I, I will only say a few words uh, um, on behalf of, of the museum as well. And um, well, first of all, thank thank you to all the to the participants uh, over the over the webinar series, over all the editions we had, uh, and all the the speakers. There was so much expertise that uh, I feel I indeed have to uh, completely uh, remake in, uh, the exhibition uh, based on all the insights I gained uh, during the series. So um, yeah, maybe I should talk to Pauline about this. <laughs> it was her suggestion. Um, and um, yeah, so, so I'm not gonna announce a new webinar as I've been in the past. Uh, this was our, our final uh, webinar. And um, yeah, as, as the exhibition also concerns uh, Indonesia and the Netherlands, uh, it was also my uh, intent to, uh, yeah, and my wish to to exchange perspectives and ideas about the themes that are tied to this exhibition, and um, yeah, ex ex exchange uh, ideas also about, yeah, the shared history uh, that, that that the Netherlands and Indonesia have, and um, and and see how yeah we both have been shaped by it, our societies have been shaped by it, and how we uh, are creating uh, uh, in the ways that uh, yeah, are informed by our mutual past. So that is that was interesting to see from a lot of different viewpoints uh, during the webinar series. And um, yeah, um, in every, every webinar, we also ran out of, 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 of time for all the questions. So I think uh, that that tells us, or that might tell us, tell us that uh, we, we don't uh, have to uh, yeah, end the conversation yet, uh, actually quite the contrary. Um, and uh, yeah, as we learned from this uh, webinar, uh, health is very important. So I also uh, want to uh, yeah express that I hope everybody stays in good health, uh, most important, so that we also can invite people uh, in our homes, um, which are also healthy. So uh, all the best to, to you, uh, both speakers and uh, uh, attendees of this webinar. A salam sejatera, and uh, I hope uh, to see you again in the near or far future.
Uh, and thank you, Anita, of course, for doing the moderating of all the uh, this one, but also the, the the webinar, the second webinar we did. So also an uh, uh, an applause for uh, Anita. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Is the is Manon still here? Hello, hello. Yes, I'm still here. Nice. Okay. I see there are still some people in the in the webinar, but yeah, Anita, we forgot to to ask the participants. Uh, or the the speakers yeah, to stay afterwards. Yes, <laughs> to no have problem. <laughs> but that's okay, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, we we over time. <laughs> yeah, we went over time, so I guess everybody also wanted to to leave at one point. I, I only see uh, yeah. Risky still here. So. Yes, hi Risky. <laughs> <laughs>